Yes, we are ready for data structures. Chapter 5, moving right along. I talked about collections, talked about stacks, talked about linked lists. I mentioned queues, but really haven't covered the queue lecture from the book yet. So I'm going to do that today. And we've actually already seen um, source code examples last week that showed us uh, linked lists implementations of queues and stacks. So today I just want to focus on the concept of the queue, how it's used, where the terminology comes from, and a couple of suggestions for how to implement one for a better utilization. So examining the queue processing, defining a queue abstract data type, focus for today, demonstrating on how a queue can be used to solve problems, also examining various queue implementations and comparing queue implementations across the board. There's some example source code um, in this lecture as well, written in Java that does a pretty nice job of a queue. Um, I believe you can probably download these examples without having to cut and paste them if you go to the author's website. I believe there's a spot to download them. And not a bad suggestion, actually. It will help you with the assignments for this course as well. And you're more than welcome and allowed to use any example you find in the book uh, for this course. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. No problem, I understand. Just don't bring it over here. <laughs> okay. All right, queues. A queue is a collection. It's a form of a collection just like a stack whose elements are added to one end and removed from the other. So if someone were to say, well, what's the difference between a stack and a queue? You could say that a stack, the elements are added to and removed from the same end, whether it be the start of the, the stack or the end of the cat, it stack, it doesn't really matter which end. And the queue is in one in which you're using both ends. So added to one and taken away from the other, it just changes the logic of the order in which the items are removed and added, actually. So therefore, a queue is processed in a first come, first in, first out, instead of a last in, first out process, which is what we get with a stack. So first in, first out, elements are removed in the same order that they arrive. So some people think that a queue is fair, more fair than a stack, but it's used for a different purpose. It's used when fairness counts, you know, like in the example here, a waiting in line queue, the checkout at a grocery store, cars at a stoplight, an assembly line. I always use the bank as a line. You know, if you're waiting in line, if you're the first one who showed up, you should be the first one who gets served, right? That's where the fairness comes into the queue. If you did a stack in that case, the people who showed up first would be pretty upset at everybody else. And it wouldn't work in that application. So queue is usually depicted horizontally by a straight line. Actually, stacks usually stacks go vertical up and down. Queues go horizontal when we when we kind of draw them out in pictures. One end of the queue is the rear, or the tail, where the elements are added to it. It doesn't mean you have to add it to the rear, but it's usually the back of the queue. Get in the back of the line. <laughs> you know, so this is where you end up going in when you enter in. And the other end is the front of the line, or the front or the head, uh, which elements are removed. You, know, so you can move it around if you wanted to. Use the other techniques. You know, use the head and the tail. Reverse the order if you wanted to. But the concept is you're, you're keeping track of the order. And the order is something that's particular with a queue. Um, we want to know who is first, who is second, who is third in line. Um, unlike a stack that operates at one end of the collection and the queue operates at both ends. Here's our conceptual view. Notice if you remember from the last lecture on stacks, it was up and down vertical. So this is where we get that horizontal look. So the conceptual view, adding an element, here's the rear. Here's the front. Let's say if this is the start of the queue, removing an element. So pretty much think of a line, people waiting in line in terms of how, how the structure is working. We have different operations. We don't have a pop and a push because we don't push anything on and pop it off, which is weird. Instead, we end queue and DQ. <laughs> so whoever came up with this stuff, I don't know who actually came up with this stuff, but it's pretty universally accepted, and you'll see the same terminology being used. So a term uh, NQ. E-N-Q-U-E is used to refer to the process of adding an element to the queue. D-Q, process of removing an element from the queue. Like a stack, pure queue does not allow users to access the element in the middle of the queue. So we don't normally have operations in a queue to insert in the middle. That's like cutting in line. So in stacks, we don't worry about that either. 
Link lists and list structures are different. That we have to worry about in terms of inserting in the middle of the line or something. Because it's not really a line, it's a different concept. And this is really just levels of abstraction that we're dealing with. So we include a two-string method for convenience so we can print the items out, uh, you know, out to the screen. There's some typical operations of a queue. doesn't mean your queue has to have these operations. But if you're going to make a generic one, these are probably going to have an end queue, a D queue. You want to know who the first one is? You could possibly do who the last one is, but there's no significance to that. We don't really care who the last person is. We know we want to know if it's empty and the size of the queue, how many people are waiting, and then the two-string to represent uh, the queue if we're going to print it out to the screen or do something with it. And uh, here's a UML kind of abstract data type queue implementation or interface. I call it an interface because it's nothing more than outlining the methods that might be implemented in a uh, class that we're going to create and nothing more than just a list that we saw in the previous slide of the methods. And the data is going to be particular towards the queue element, so if it's a queue of integers, a queue of floats, we would have a separate uh, piece that would actually represent the item or the node. Did you have a question? In stack and queue in both, we cannot insert anything. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to have inserting in the middle. The concept of the stack is to load a bunch of stuff up and then work through it as a set, a group. We're not caring about the order. We just load it up and then we unload it. I load it up, unload it up. Q never really empties out sometimes. We're just caring about putting something in and then taking the person who's been waiting the longest out, putting something in. We don't care at any moment of the time when we put something in to be fair and to violate, not to violate the Q process. We don't usually put people in the middle of the line <laughs> unless they're special. And then, there are, you know, then everyone in the line is going to be complaining. Same thing with the stack. There's no reason to go you know, back and put something in the stack, which differentiates it from a list. A list is a little different. We can reorder a list. We can insert items in the list. Like, example, we have a list of alphabetical order of the people in the class. New person joins the class. We've got to insert them somewhere in the list. It may not necessarily be at the end. So a list is more on the order, keeping track of the order. Q and stack, slightly different abstraction to it, so we don't necessarily include a method or any functionality to insert in the middle. We just worry about one end or the other, essentially. So the uh, interface here, if we were going to implement it, we would have uh, an interface. If you're not familiar with the concept of an interface, just think of it sort of like a template almost. You know, these are the methods that we're going to implement in our, and we can. We can extend classes and then we can uh, use interfaces essentially to uh, build upon a hierarchy of functionality. To add one element to the rear, we would have an NQ. Essentially, remove an element. We would have a DQ here uh, to get the first element to see if it's empty. When it's empty, we can pretty much stop our, uh, stop our routine. To get the size, so we know how many people are in line. Get a size, or do then the two string operation to essentially make it printable. Coded messages. So let's use a queue. We're going to use a queue to help us encode and decode a message. So this is a good way of uh, applying the concept to a programming uh, construct. So this is why we're studying data structures, so we can solve problems using data structures. So a queue would be a good application of uh, this concept. So we have a uh, you know, the Caesar cipher says, you know, actually I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this concept, but to take a message like hello world and then uh, the Caesar cipher algorithm would take and maybe the first character if it's an H, you know, for example, and exchange it with the last character or have some sort of an algorithm to use to switch around the characters a little bit. <laughs> so you use a, an algorithm, a preset format to replace. In fact, you could you know, say H, well that is a, what alphabetical character is that, and then have another language that goes, in, let's say it's five, for example, and then go to one, two, three, four, five, and then, oh, that's P, so that H gets replaced with a P or something, so it's a way of decoding, encoding it, so that you can decode it with a reverse algorithm. So Caesar, uh, here's another example of this, Caesar includes a method by shifting each letter in the message by a constant amount K, 
So let's say k is equal to 5. So the a becomes f. You know, a, b, c, d, e, f is the fifth character. So and then f. b becomes g. So one of the primitive. This still being used actually. Kids, kids love to do this. You can take a message. It's kind of like Pig Latin, but Pig Latin's too easy to figure out. So you can use a Caesar cipher algorithm. You know, say the number hidden number is five. You know, and all of a sudden you can change all the words and move them over five characters. That's too easy. Can I get like 5 divided by 2 or something? We have to get integer values out of this. So maybe 5 divided by something. I don't know. Or make it more complicated. You know, a lot of people actually do is they take words. And they take a sentence. And then they apply 5 to the sentence. So if it's like, hello world. And the number was 2. And we started with 1. And every character was like 2 would be an E. Or hello. <laughs> you know, so that's actually a more popular way of doing it because you don't know you don't know what the hidden phrase is and you don't want to know what the number is. Because if you can figure out the number this way, you can easily go, oh, that's five. Just take the first character and see how many is it offset by, and you can figure that out. But what if you don't know the hidden phrase? So interesting. It's kind of like a password, and I would say it probably has about the same amount of protection as password protection <laughs> it does. Okay, so it's uh, fairly easy to break this. An improvement can be made by changing how much a letter is shifted depending upon where the letter is in the message. Another common approach. So a repeating key uh, is a series of integers that determines how much each character is shifted. For example, consider the repeating key 317425. The first character is in the message is shifted by 3. This is another yet another way of doing it. So first, second, third, so you go first, second, third, fourth, and then. Anyway, first one is by three, by one, so you have a hidden code and you shift it by this code. Again, another way of password protecting it, sort of. If you think about it, you know, just know the code, you know, the shifting. The next one is one, the next one is seven, so on. Of course, you have to have 26 of these <laughs> for every character, I mean, or I don't know. Anyway, you know what I mean. And for as long as the message is, you need a code that's going to fit the length, so. And uh, when the key is exhausted, uh, you start over again at the beginning of the key. Uh, actually, that better approach, maybe. So here's an encoding of a message using a repeating key. So we have the encoded message, no evangel, I, you, whatever. And here's the key. And here's the decoded message, knowledge is power. <laughs> so we can apply the shift, K3, N1, O7. So. Great example for a Q, actually, because we have to keep track of the first, second, third, fourth, and then the last character. And then we can have a Q of the key, and we can have a Q. Actually, we could do this in an array if we wanted to. Put the message in an array, put the key in an array, and apply the, the index values that match. So 0, 1, 2, 3 would correspond to the shift for each one of the uh, characters. And it would be a Q implementation. So here in our coded message, <coughs> we'll use a Q to store the values of the key and it will dequeue the value when needed and uh, after using a key value then we'll enqueue it back into the end of the queue so we rotate the key so because we're going to run out of key values <laughs> we're going to run out of key numbers eventually especially if we only have five or six of them there so we repeat the keys this way the queue represents the constant cycling values in the key so let's take a look at a sample implementation here. And this is the code I was talking about. You can probably download it from the website. Uh, take a look at it. Here's going to be our public class codes. And in here we're going to encode and decode a message using the key value stored in the queue as I just described. In main. Look at that. It looks like an array, doesn't it? So we can have an array for the key. And then uh, we have an integer key value to keep track of the key value. And then uh, the string, which is going to be a string, there's going to be an encoded string and a decoded string. And then the, the string we're going to do is all programmers are playwrights and all computers are lousy actors. <laughs> Interesting metaphor, I guess. Uh, then we have a circular array queue. So we're going to use arrays to do this. Well, arrays actually make really good queues because we never insert in the middle. We always go one end or the other, so we can always pop off. And then we leave it empty, just the array just never goes away. 
Uh, so we have two cues that are set up, and these are going to be the circular array queue. It's going to be a key, key Q1, key Q2, which are going to keep track of integers. We're doing numbers in here. We're going to load the key values. Yeah, they'll load the key Q. So to take the key, um, scan it in, put it into the array, to essentially take our scan here for elements 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, load it up with the message, and then load up the other array with the um, with the, the key that we're using, the set of numbers. And then we're essentially going to compare, we're going to add one to the, we're going to use one to modify the other, as I just previously described. So to decode the message, we go through and we apply the key value and subtract out. I'm not going to go through the code because it doesn't make very much sense until you actually see it work in a programming language. So I highly encourage you to download the code and look at it on your own. In terms of the UML description of the code program, this is what we're looking at. We've got the linked queue here, where we have a front and a rear that we're going to keep track of, and the operations the NQ, DQ, first empty, and those are the basic operations. And then we have the queue, abstract data type, and then we have the code, which is going to be the main stream, which is the main driver program. So we basically have a main driver program that's creating a linked queue and queue items. We have two queues, actually, in this item. One of them is the string that we're encoding and decoding, and the other one is the key that we're going to apply to it. So that's one example in terms of, um, in fact, you can use this to encode a message, decode a message. And also it would apply towards translation. You want to take something from English and translate it into another language or vice versa. Here's another one. And there's plenty of queue examples out there in the world, actually, because everyone stands in a queue. <laughs> that's what happens when you have a lot of people in the area. You have to wait in line. Uh, ticket counter simulator. So now we're going to use a queue to simulate waiting in line at a movie theater. Everyone probably can relate to that one. The goal is to determine how many cashiers are needed to keep track of the keep the waiting line below seven minutes. Kind of like the algorithm that they should really apply at banks. You know, waiting in line is minimized. So we'll assume customers arrive on an average of every 15 seconds. It's an assumption. We just have to put that in there. And then we're going to process a request. And that process takes about two minutes once the customer reaches the counter because the customer already knows what movie they want to see. So they just tell the ticket counter person and the ticket counter person sells them a ticket. So here we have the uh, customer class, represent the customer. And the customer has an arrival time and has a departure time. It's two variables. And that's really all we have to keep track of. We have to get the arrival time, we have to set the arrival time, um, set the departure time, get the arrival time to uh, keep track of these customers because we don't want to let them wait more than seven minutes. And uh, so we have the set and the gets and then we have the total time that we can keep track of in terms of uh, how much time do they wait in line. Was it under seven minutes is what we're interested in finding out. And then we have the ticket counter class that's going to have a customer in there. And that's the information we're going to store about the customer. And now the ticket counter class is going to have a number of processes you know, to process uh, maximum number of cashiers, maximum number of customers. So we can kind of coordinate the two and add more cashiers if we end up with too many customers. So we have make an instance of the object of the customer, 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 make a linked queue again. And the linked queue is going to be a new queue of customers. And we're going to have a cashier time. We're going to keep track of the times per customer. So essentially what we're doing is, again, using another double array. One is going to keep track of the times, the other one is going to keep track of the customers, so we can fluctuate. And then we have a process that's going to simulate the various different number of cashiers. And then uh, load the queue, go through the queue, empty the queue, and keep track of the stats in terms of how long it takes to service a customer. And then if, as we're going through it, we decide it's taking too long, we can add another cashier and then dynamically affect the speed by making the customers run faster. The thing about it, this is what people do on a regular basis when they're monitoring a situation. You know, it's like, it's not happening fast enough. Okay, add another person. <laughs> Open another checkout stand. Okay, and then the lines go down. Just how you manage most of the customer service stuff. And here's an example of the description of the ticket counter program if we were to make it into UML notation. We have a linked queue in the queue again. And all we're looking at now is the addition of another item, the customer. And the customer is running from the ticket counter main driver program. And the customer basically has all of this information associated with them. So it's a great demonstration of how to use classes inside of arrays or linked 
cues that were, uh, and it, your implementation can vary depending upon the language that you're using. This is just basically using uh, built-in Java linked cues, essentially. Linked list to show cues. So the results of the ticket counter simulation, we have the number of cashiers, 1 through 10, and the average time in seconds. Looks like this guy was pretty slow. Average time was pretty high. <laughs> number of seconds for here. But then it, it went down lower towards the end because they probably added another cashier, another ticket counter person. So, so you can kind of see how this could be applied in, um, in a business application, essentially, for the logic. So the linked queue class, a little bit of information on that. Like a stack, the queue can be implemented using an underlying array or a linked list. Either one of them actually would accomplish the same goal. In fact, if I were doing this in C or C++, I'd just use an array for it. If we're doing it in Java, I'd probably use a linked list. Create a linked queue just because it's easier. A uh, linked version can use the link linear node class, um, again, to, to keep track of each one of the nodes, in this case there are customers. In addition to keeping track of the reference to the beginning of the list, you can also get, take a, keep a second reference to the end if you wanted to. And you can keep track of when it's done. Integer counter can also keep track of the number of elements that are in the queue. Instead of having to add up the elements, you can just have a counter. Every time you add something in the queue, you increment it. Every time you take something out of the queue, you decrement it. So at any one moment of time, you would actually know how many people were in the queue. <laughs> You have a counter like that. So here's the implementation of a linked kind of structure where we have the front that has A in it and then A is linked to B so there's a next node. These are nodes, they're linked together, each node knows about its neighbor. We have the front, we have the rear, and we're going to add to one, take away from the other. So, and the counter is four, zero, one, two, well, one, two, three, four, if we start with one essentially. People don't like to start counters with zero for some reason. You can count with zero, add one, one, two, three, <laughs> where you get counting numbers. So, And here's our linked queue class if we were to implement it. So we have uh, essentially a counter that we're keeping track of and a linear node that we've got a front and a rear. So we've created these particular nodes, the front and the rear, and then we put everything in between, essentially. We increment the counter every time we put something in. So here's our counter plus plus. If we're going to empty the queue, decrement the queue, increment it. So here's the queue after we added E to it, put it at the end of the queue. So now the counter is 5. Before it was 4, and we, did, we didn't have this E in here. So. And we just make E point to the rear, which means it's the last item in the queue. To dequeue the operation, we remove the item from the queue, so it returns the uh, last item. Throw as an empty collection exception if the uh, queue is empty, which is actually that's one of the benefits you have of using Java is uh, being able to throw the exceptions. So I'm being able to actually not only throw them, but you know, catch the exception, actually deal with it, so it doesn't actually stop your program, but it, in automated kind of way of dealing with the structure the performance the behavior of what happens in certain scenarios. So. It's all built in for you. <laughs> so, Versus having to do it manually. Uh, the queue after a DQ operation when we pulled it, uh, whatever item that was out of there and it went back down to four. Actually what item did we pull out? We had A, B, C, D, and E. Five items and we pulled one out. Oh we pulled it off the front. Oh, obviously we're taking one off the top. The guy's been here the longest. We're adding to this end, removing from this end. So we removed the A, now we have four items left on a DQ. And that's really the only thing you actually have to remember in terms of a Q. You're pulling, removing from one end and adding to the other end. And you hopefully you want to have a you know, system of aging going on. So the person who's been waiting the longest is the next person who gets off and gets out of the queue. Uh, let's see other operations that might be associated with the linked queue, the remaining operations in the linked queue implementation are fairly straightforward and are similar to those of a stack collection. In fact, queues are pretty easy to talk about after you talk about stacks because it's the same item, it's the same structure essentially, it's just different terminology, different order. So the first operation is implemented by returning a reference to the element at the front of the queue. 
These Q operation returns true if the count of the element is zero, false otherwise. The size operation simply returns the count of the elements in the cube of the size. If you're not keeping a counter, then you would be able to go through and just, you know, manually add up how many items are in the queue. The two string operations then return uh, a string made up of the string results of each one of the individual elements. In terms of the implementation of queues with arrays, one strategy for implementing a queue would be to fix one end of the queue at position zero in a, an array, like it would be uh, like an, an array stack, actually. You just go zero, one, two, three to the end. Queues operate at both ends, uh, which forces the shifting of elements either in an NQ or a DQ kind of fashion. You can physically shift it or you can use a counter to keep track of the end. So if you had a 0 through 5, kind of a small queue, and you already DQ'd 0, and you went to 0 and it was empty, <laughs> then you'd have to Z DQ 1, and then that would be empty. And then you'd have to constantly go through and check for this one's empty, this one's empty, okay, next and then go to the 1, and then DQ that item, and then go to 2. So it's a little bit, in an array situation, there's a little bit more checking that has to be done. Or shifting. And most people aren't going to spend the time to shift the elements. Why bother? Just fill up the queue, and then shift it. Only problem is, if you don't shift it, you run out of room in the array. It's a fixed size. It's allocated at a fixed size. So. By the time you get through, then it's like the 20th element, and there's only 50 items in the array. You only have room for 20 left. 25, excuse me, 30 left. <laughs> so you're going to run out of room eventually, unless you do shift it. And you can't wait for it to empty because it never empties. There's always people in line. So kind of an interesting phenomenon. You end up having to shift it just to make use of the structure. Queues operate on both ends, so which forces the shifting of elements either on an NQ or a DQ. Possibly see the imagined situation. A better approach is to use a conceptual circular array and not fix the end of the queue. So you're circulating through the items and you are essentially um, treating both ends instead of just going from one end. So if we do not fix one end of the queue at index zero, then we have to shift the elements. A circular queue is an implementation of the queue using an array that conceptually loops around on itself. So after we ran out of elements, then we go back to the beginning, because imagine we, we're not going to do any shifting. We've removed 0 through 5. Those are all empty. Next one we're going to remove is 6, but we've run out of spaces. Instead, what we do is we put this, the start of the queue keeps moving. <laughs> And then we rotate around, which is why they call it a circular queue. We rotate it so 0, 1, 2, 3 is now being used. So imagine it just kind of goes like this in terms of the usage, which requires no shifting. So we just keep a current node that is the end or the start of the queue. And we keep track of the start and the end, and we just add to the end, take from the start, add to the end, take from the start. And that just keeps moving through the array structure. Uh, because uh, going back to the lecture number two on algorithms and efficiency, the last thing we want to do is reorder that queue. <laughs> Shift all the item items over is way too inefficient. So a circular queue makes a lot more sense. So we have the index is thought to proceed, uh, index zero. So we keep track of the integers that indicate where the front and the rear of the queue are at any given time, and we can just keep rotating that through the circular. And here's, here's got a picture of it. Think about it. But um, just imagine we go back to the beginning and we fill in the empty spaces with the end of the queue. Eventually it'll come back and it'll all fill up and we'll be, be able to take back. Because when we reach the end of the array, we go back to the front of the array <laughs> to start removing items. So it's referred to as a circular array implementation of a queue. And a circular array implementation is usually done in this fashion. Do you see why we could possibly do a circular array of a stack, but never have a need to. Because we're always pushing it on, taking it off from the same end of the queue. So we always know the last item. So there's no need to actually implement a circular implementation of that. But a queue, we need the circular implementation of it. Because in order to keep the order of the last first one in as the first one out. If we were just pushing stuff on, we would just make a new stack, make a new stack, make a new stack if we're going to do that. 
if we ran out of entries, we just start a new one. <laughs> Keep loading it up, and we pop it down, push, pop it off until we get back to the beginning. So we build up, push it down, build up, push it down, versus going around and around. So. Which is interesting. Here's a queue uh, straddling the end of the circular array. And we've got, I don't know, we had 99 items, and we go back to zero. So the front is 99, the rear is 2, count is 4. <laughs> Because we're over here now, we have four items in it, but we're way over here because everything else was empty. So here's changing the circular implementation of a queue. You can kind of see how you know, it ended up good. We emptied it off, emptied it off. Now it's over here. Now we have to wrap around. We're back to the beginning. We end up having a hole somewhere, and the hole is where we're adding stuff to the end. There's de usually. It doesn't have to be. We could fill it up completely. But at one point we got an end and a start. <laughs> and there's no necessarily, there's not a necessary uh, uh, requirement that we have this is the end and this is the start, reading left to right. We could do the opposite direction as well. That's not necessary. Uh, it doesn't violate Q properties to go left to right instead of right to left. Or, I guess we normally go left to right. Think about it. To go right to left is not going to violate it. It's like, you know, it depends on what order the people stand. Do they stand to the left or do they stand to the right of the person when they line up? Which is the same property that's uh, being represented by the queue. So circular queues, so when an element is in queue, the value of the rear is incremented, so we know where the rear is. Uh, but it must also take into account the need for the loop to go back to zero. So the rear is equal to the rear plus one. And we know about the queue length, essentially. So note that the queue implementation can also reach capacity and may need to be enlarged as well. Just because we're using a circular queue doesn't necessarily mean we're going to run out of array. We're not going to run out of array elements. We still have the possibility of running out of array elements. <laughs> That's the case, we could also open up another queue. But in that case, it's probably better just to make the queue bigger, make the size bigger. Put more ropes out at the bank. <laughs> All right, here's an example code for our circular array implementation. And uh, our queue here is going to represent a uh, array implementation of the queue, for which we're going to use a circular concept. It's going to be the same code as uh, looked at a few minutes ago except for instead of adding at the end we're keeping track of the end and we're re we're locating it at the beginning when we run out of spaces so we're just incrementing it to a certain point and then going back to the beginning yes this one uh, the value width is incremented the value when the element is n q, when we're putting it in, the value of the rear is incremented. So it's, we're actually increasing it at the rear, but it must take into account the need for the loop back to zero. So we take the distance between zero and the start, that empty space, and we account for that in terms of the quantity. We subtract that. We, we can you take this approach to it, or you can take the conceptual approach of keeping track of we started, let's say we ran out of entries and we started back at zero. So we have that little space there in order to calculate, well, what position really is it? It's not zero. It can't be zero. Instead, it has to be 99 or 100. Let's say we have 100 elements in there. So it's really 101 or 102, 103. Or we could take and subtract that out and go, it's 100 minus five spaces that are missing. We're really at the 95th because we have a hole in the queue numbering system. So we're, what we're doing in this calculation, what we're doing is figuring out the length, essentially dividing it by, or having a calculation where we're going to actually determine how many items are in the queue without looking at the position number. So we're taking that hole into consideration that we have zero, actually so say we're taking up number zero, but we have one through twelve empty. <laughs> so if we didn't take that into consideration, we might be thinking, oh, that's element zero. Well, it's not going to make any sense. Or we can say it's 99 plus 1, 101, or excuse me, 100 plus 1, 101 minus 12 is going to give us our actual size of the queue. 
in the position of the end. Because the end isn't the realistic end anymore, if that makes any sense. Anyway, what this slide's basically alluding to is it's the fact that you have to actually calculate where the end really is. <laughs> it's not a when you NQ it, you can decrement it. When you DQ, excuse me, when you NQ it, you can increment it. When you DQ it, you can N, uh, decrease the amount, <laughs> but you still have to keep track of the position in relative of the Q size so, to keep track of the empty holes it, to account for the empty spaces that might exist. It's easy when you say, well, I'm going to add five people to the Q and go one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> And go, that's the sixth person in the queue because it's number six. But if you started at four, hmm, okay, so four, five, six, the number's going to be wrong, so you have to subtract the four out of it to go, well, that's really the fifth position instead of the ninth position because we started at four instead of zero or one. So you're calculating essentially for the, for the uh, difference. In this implementation, and again, you can download it, take it out, take it, you know, we, got, we have a default capacity, we've got a rear, we have a front, and we're going to essentially NQ something and then increment, so it adds a specific element to the rear of the queue, expand the capacity of the queue array if necessary, and then, uh, and there's our, <coughs> there's that formula, actually. It's for the size. So the size is going to be the queue length, expand capacity if it's too big. The Q rear is going to be the element. The rear is going to be the rear plus one divided by Q dot length, but by by the length essentially to come up with the position. And then count plus plus to say we've added an item, we've added an item, we've subtracted an item. <coughs> Here's the subtraction that was the adding, removing an item from the front of the Q, returns the reference to it, throwing an empty uh, collection exception in, if one exists. The queue is empty and we try to remove an item. Hopefully we'll throw an exception on that. And uh, also doing the same kind of calculation on the front of the queue. You can go to see if we're empty. How are you going to know if you're empty if you're at number 99? But 0 through 97 is full. <laughs> I have to go back and check to see what's what's been taken. Here's the expand capacity operation. can't do this if you're really using arrays. So if you were doing an indexed array structure, array queue, that was your own implementation using pointers, you can expand it. Otherwise, you're stuck with a static implementation of an array. Um, if you're looking at the concept of a static implementation of an array, you expand it by going back and reusing numbers that are empty. So you're adding room to the end of the queue by using zero through whatever number you happen to be on when you've removed items from the queue, which are empty space holders. It's expanding the length of the queue. If you think about it, the queue can be unlimited in length if you're creating a circular uh, circular queue because and it can only hold so many items, like a hundred items at one time. But as one comes off, you can always put one back in. <laughs> no matter where you are in the queue. As long as you're keeping track of the head and the tail. In terms of the queue implementation, the algorithm efficiency gives us a big old one for both implementations of the NQ operation. For the DQ, it's the same for linked and circular array implementations, but uh, O to the N for the non-circular array version, do the need to shift it. So as I was mentioning before, the shifting of the elements in the queue is going to throw off the efficiency. And the number of shifts is going to give us, raise our big O notation to something that's going to be not very efficient in the long run. Otherwise, we're looking at a pretty good NQ and DQ. We're going to run at around the same speed, same efficiency. It's going to be for the number of items, essentially. That was a quick lecture, actually. That was a quick chapter, actually. Do we want more? Or do we want to wait till next week? Next week? <laughs> oh, that was quick. <laughs> All right. No, no, that's okay. That's why I asked. Some students want their money's worth. Some students want to get out early. <laughs> so today will be one of those days where we get out early. <laughs> so, um, Actually, the, the thing with queues is that it's kind of easy. It's uh, compared after we've already gone over stacks. Why did they, why did author made a separate chapter on queues? I want to put queues and stacks together into one, one chapter, but because the concept's so similar. But if you're brand new to data structures, the concept of the queue might be something that is uh, different. 
one, so it might, might throw you off. And really, the, the data structures in general is an undergraduate kind of level subject matter. So it's not as hard as most people would think anyway. So We'll leave you at that. Next week, we'll go on to chapter number six. And chapter number six, I don't know what that's on yet. Actually, do I have chapter number six? No, I don't. We'll find out next week. Chapter number six. It'll be a mystery. So I'll come back next week for the mystery chapter six. I want to bet link list. That's what I want to bet that's on. So we'll see. All right.